All right, so I'm, I'm preaching on the topic of hell tonight, the topic of hell. Um, now, hell is a really important topic because hell, like we talked about, reasons to go soul winning, it should be a reason to motivate us to go soul winning, right? But this sermon is not so much about motivating us to go soul winning. This sermon's more about the doctrinal issue of hell because I feel that there is a lot of misconceptions about hell. Now, if you've heard me teach on hell before, you probably know a lot of the misconceptions that I'm going to go through today. But if you haven't heard this sermon before, then hopefully this is a bit of an eye-opener for you in terms of what the Bible actually teaches about hell as opposed to the misconceptions that people in the world or even Christians have about hell. And I'll just try and support what I believe about hell from the Word of God. So tonight I'm going to go through seven truths about hell um, and, things, and hopefully you'll learn something new today. Now, the first thing is, and I don't think anyone here really denies this, but some people do believe that hell is not actually a literal place. You know, they just believe it's just like uh, something that was just warned about, but, you know, when you die, there, there is no hell. It's not, a, not actually a place that you go to. But no, no, no. In the Bible, hell is a literal place of fire that actually exists. And if somebody dies without the Lord Jesus Christ, without believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be in a place of fire and it's called hell and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever think about what jesus says here in mark 9 he's warning here about hell he says if thy hand offend thee cut it off it is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched so here we see that he's talking about hell it's a place of fire. It's a fire that never shall be quenched. What does that mean? It never goes out, right? But it doesn't even consume what it's burning. If you think about the fire uh, on the burning bush when Moses spoke with God that it burned the bush, but it didn't consume the bush. This is like the fires in hell where it burns and it torments, but it doesn't actually consume what it's burning. So it never quenches and it, it never kills what it's burning. That's why it says the worm dieth not. And the fire is not quenched. So people in hell are like being eaten by worms, but those worms don't die from the fires in hell. Why is this? This is a really terrible place. Now, if, G if Jesus says here, hey, it's better for you to just cut your hand off than even go to this place, what sense would it make if this place doesn't even exist? Right? If this place doesn't even exist, if hell is just a like it's just a just a just a, a an analogy of something. Why is Jesus going to the extreme of saying, "Hey, it's better for you to just cut your hand off if your hand is what's causing you to go to hell, rather than to go into hell with both hands?" It says here, "If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not." quenched now when i read this passage i think of that movie saw you know did, did anyone watch that movie saw it was such a gross movie I don't, I don't know how i came across it. i watched it a long time ago i think i was just curious to know what it was about because it was a bit bit of a different horror flick but if you don't know the storyline in saw basically this guy wakes up he finds himself in this torture room there's this this crazy guy's like torturing him, and he's and his foot is like chained to to the wall right so he can't get out and I don't, I don't know all the plot, right? Because I don't remember the story exactly. But the whole idea, the whole reason why that this movie was called Saw is because the guy gave him a, a hacksaw in that room and basically was testing him, do you want to stay in this room and be tortured or are you willing to literally cut your own foot off to get out of that room? And as gruesome as that movie is, I, you know, it's, it's, it, I don't think, it doesn't actually show him cutting off his foot, but at the end of the movie, he actually decides it is worth it. And he, he's like cutting, he's like, ah, and then he's like climbing out and then you don't really see his foot or anything, but you can just imagine that he's just sawed his own foot off to get out of that place of torture. Now, even though that movie is so gruesome, this is the, this is the analogy that Jesus is giving about hell. Isn't that interesting? He's saying here, hell, he says, if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. So Jesus is actually using, hell is such a terrible place that he's saying you would rather, like the guy in Saul, you'd rather cut your own foot off to escape that place than having both your feet and staying in that place. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God having with, with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where their worm dieth not and the fire 
is not quenched. Now, when you hear thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. Now, you hear that word pluck, it sounds very pleasant. It sounds like, you know, just plucking a fruit off a tree. But if you imagine what Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying it's better. You, you can, can you imagine just ripping your own eye out, like ripping it from its root? Like this is something that's, that, this is, like, nobody can imagine ever doing something like that. Yet Jesus is saying, hey, you would rather do that if your eye is causing you to go to hell because this is how terrible hell is. Now, does it make sense if hell doesn't even exist? Of course not. It's a literal place. It's a real place where hell is. Jesus says here in uh, Matthew 26, and I know the context here is about uh, Judas who betrayed him, but the principle is there. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Why? Because he was going to go to hell. So he's saying, hey, it's, it's better that you're not even born than you are born and then you die and go to hell. Because it's a, it's, a, it's a terrible place. It's a place of torment. It's the place of God's wrath. And, you know, people joke. People scoff at hell. You know, people say things like, oh, you know, I want to go to hell because all my mates are there. You know, they're going to party and whatever, you know. And it's like, it's because you don't know what hell's like. You can only make those jokes because you don't believe that hell exists. But if you really knew what hell was like, you know, think about the, the rich man in Luke. He, he knew what hell was like. And he's like, I don't want anybody to come here, you know. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. I just left that there because I just... Well, I just think, like, what was Judas thinking? Like, he, he, yeah, I mean, obviously he... I mean, I, I don't know, uh, obviously, everything that he was thinking because obviously he knew that Jesus knew that he was going to betray him and yet he still did it. And, and obviously because Satan entered into him. So um, I just thought that was a bit profound that he asked Jesus, am I going to betray you? And Jesus said to him, yes, it's you. Right, number one, so hell is a literal place. Jesus didn't warn us about a place that just doesn't exist. It would just be ludicrous for Jesus to say, hey, pluck your eye out rather than go to hell if hell is not even a real place. So it's a literal place. Number two is where is hell located? Where is hell located? Now, I do believe the earth is round. Sorry, guys, if you believe that the earth is flat. I believe the earth is round, right? So the earth, I, I believe the earth is a globe, and that's why I believe right now hell is located in the center of the earth in the center of the earth. why do we know that because the bible always describes hell as down right everywhere we read about hell deuteronomy 32 22 for a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell so you see how it's always down heaven's always up hell is always down and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains right so the bottoms of them Psalm 55, 15, let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. Look at Ezekiel 31. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit. Oh, I forgot to underline that one. And all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. If you think about Jonah being in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. They also went down into hell with him unto them that be slain with the sword, and they that were his arm that dwelt under his shadow in the midst of the heathen. And the last one I want to show you here is Matthew 11. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For of the mighty works which have been done in thee have been done in Sodom, it will remain unto this day. So if you believe in a globe earth, which, which I do, hell is in the, in the heart of the earth. It's in the very center. And it's interesting that even when they drill down, you know, when you, when you see volcanoes, what comes out of these volcanoes? It's fire and it's brimstone, right? So it makes sense that something hot is down there because when, when, we, when they drill, they can't even get through the crust, but we see molten lava and molten rock coming out of it. Why? Because that's where hell is. This place of fire in the center of the earth where souls go to burn uh, if they haven't believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Number three. So one, it's a literal place. Number two, you know, where is it located? It's located in the center of the earth. And it's just interesting that even science tells us that it's a place of fire in there. It's not, you know, science is trying to tell us that in the center of the earth, it's just this core of lead. You know, they say they, they, they show you the cross section of the earth. They don't know what's down there. You know, I mean, they bounce their sound waves and they have their theories and all this stuff. But, you know, when you find out how far they've actually drilled into the earth, I don't know exactly how far they've gone down, but they've gone down like nothing. 
You know, somebody, I, I've heard somebody describe it like this. If you had an apple, the skin of the apple, man hasn't even like, drilled past the skin of that apple. You know, they have no idea what's in the center of the earth. Right? No idea. That's because hell is there. God's told us what's there. Now, the third thing I want you to know about hell is hell is a place of judgment. It's a place of God's righteous judgment. It's not Satan's headquarters. Because some people get this idea that God is the God of heaven and Satan is the God of hell. And that's where he operates. And you'll see cartoons like The Simpsons where people go into hell and Satan's there ruling and reigning and he's telling his minions to, to torture everyone. It's just That's his kingdom down there. No, 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 that's, that's not how it works. Satan is not the God of hell. God is actually the God of hell. Right? God is not only the God of heaven, God is the God of hell. And that's why this idea where people say things like, uh, you know, that's out of the pits of hell in the terms of Satan's minions coming out of hell. I don't believe that's biblical, you know, because that's not where Satan, you know, gathers his army and that's where all they're being bred and trained and then they come out of there, you know, and, and that's where, you know, that's what the Satan's minions are coming from out of hell. So things don't go, things don't come from hell, you know, from Satan. Think, things go to hell to get punished by God. Right? So that's the difference. So there's not this out of the pits of hell. Jesus is the one that owns hell. That's why he has the keys of hell and death. He says, and when I saw him, talking about Jesus in Revelation 1, I fell at his feet as dead and he laid his right hand upon me, saying uh, unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of death, of hell and of death. So things just don't come out of, in and out of hell willy-nilly without Jesus' command, right? Because Jesus is the owner of hell. He has the keys of death and of hell. He is the one that determines what can go in and come out of hell. And the fact that he has the keys of hell and death shows that he's the owner of hell and death, right? It's like if you have the keys to your house because you're the owner of that house right? It's the same here. Jesus is the owner of it because he has the keys. Uh, I want to just talk about these passages here because this, this I believe, is an often under, misunderstood passage uh, in Matthew 16. It says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Right? So they are, he's asking his disciples, Who am I? Simon Peter correctly identifies him and says, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bardrona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. So what is the it that was revealed unto him? The fact that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. But my Father, which is in heaven. Now Catholics often misunderstand this passage because they believe the church is built on Peter rather than on the rock that Jesus is referring to here. And it says here, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock... Now, is he referring to Peter as the rock? Or is the, this rock what we know throughout the whole Bible, which is Jesus Christ, right? The fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, which is what is being revealed. This is the rock. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, what I find is different about how most people understand this passage is they think this passage means that hell is like a kingdom, right? And there's, these are the gates of hell. And when, when it says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, they think the it is the church of God. And the church of God as an army of God is storming the gates of hell like it's a stronghold of Satan. And, and, and it says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, meaning we are able to get through those gates. Right? Now, the reason why it doesn't make sense is because hell is not Satan's dominion, hell is a righteous punishment from God, why would it make sense that the church of God is charging into a place of God's wrath and punishment? Right? It doesn't make sense. So I don't think it's that that's what it means, right? that it says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I don't think what he's talking about is the church. What I think he's talking about is Jesus actually going to hell. Right? He went to hell for our sins. And when it says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, the it is the rock, the fact that Jesus Christ is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And because he descended into hell to pay for our sins, the gates of hell, which is meant to keep people in hell, right? because you can't get out of hell, they will not prevail against Jesus Christ. Because right? he has the keys of death and hell, and he rose again from the dead. 
So that's how I understand that passage. And I know it's often been preached that it's about, you know, the church will, and I, I believe that the church will always exist. So it's not that I'm debunking that doctrine. I do believe the church will always exist throughout time. And that's the church that Jesus Christ is building on the rock. I just believe that when it says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, it's referring to the rock descending into hell for our sins and him overcoming death and hell. And he says, I'll give unto thee the keys Look at this, so Jesus not only has the keys of death and of hell, but he has the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So you see how he's the owner of heaven and he's the owner of hell. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So that's us being able to win people to Jesus Christ, right? And if we win somebody to Christ, then they will have eternal life. They will be bound in heaven. Okay, so uh, let's keep going. So here, um, just this idea of Satan's minions... Um, somebody might say, well, the Bible talks about the child of hell in Matthew 23. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves. So you see here that these people are condemned to hell. Neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Right? So what's the context here that these people are bound for hell, right? Because they're not saved. Now, if you think about that, that might make sense of Matthew 23, 15, where he says, Why aren't you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? For you compass sea and land and make one proselyte. So this is a convert. And when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. So why were they, why were they a child of hell? Because they were condemned to hell. Right, they're damned to hell. And he's saying, hey, this person's a child of hell, not because like Satan has minions coming out of hell, it's just because he's condemned to hell too, because you make this proselyte and now he's twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Even here in Revelation 9, there are creatures coming out of the bottomless pit, but look at what these creatures are doing. It says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions on the earth have power. So here's these creatures that are like locusts, like scorpions, right? And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but look at this, only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So these creatures that are coming out of the bottomless pit in Revelation 9, are they come to attack believers? No, 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 they're, they've come to, to torment unbelievers, right? So you see again, it's not like the Satan's minions here. These are, these are God's creatures in hell that probably do some of the tormenting coming out onto the earth to torment men that were unrepentant on the earth. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those, look at this, and in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. What a thought. That's what hell is like. When people go to hell, they want to die. I mean, if you're in a place where you're tormented day and night forever and ever, such a terrible place, you, you would wish that it was over, that you would die. You would seek death, like it says here, but you won't find it. You'll desire to die and death will flee from you. So this is like a, a, an experience of hell on earth when these creatures come out. So hell like i said hell is not hell is god's righteous judgment it's not satan's kingdom he's not the god of hell because one day satan will be cast into hell right it says here in matthew 25 this is jesus sitting on the throne here then shall he say also unto them on the left hand depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire look at this prepared for the devil and his angels so why was hell created in the beginning it was actually created to punish satan and his and his devils but, you know, man sinned and then man was deserving of hell too. And that's why Jesus Christ came to die for our sins. Matthew 8 says that when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, they met with him too, possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fear, so that no man might pass by that way. Look at this. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither, look at this, to torment us before the time? 
Right? So they understand that Jesus is the God of hell and one day they're going to be tormented by Jesus. This is why when they see Jesus, they fear Jesus. And there was a good way off from them and heard of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go into, way into the herd of swine. Right? Because they don't want to be cast into hell because that's where they're eventually going to go. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine. And behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. This would make sense of James 2.19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Right? So they don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They just believe they're monotheists, right? just like we're monotheists. Um, the devils also believe and tremble. Why are they trembling? Because the hell is not their dominion. No, it's because one day they're going to be thrown to hell. Isaiah 14 is the, pro the prophecy of Satan. Like Satan hasn't gone to hell yet. right? He's still able to go in between earth and heaven like in Job. But in Revelation, before the tribulation starts, they, yeah, that's when he's going to be cast out of hell, right? He's actually going to be cast out of hell. And then, you know, after that, he's going to be bound and put into hell for a thousand years. We read in Revelation. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It is raised up from their thrones, all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Look, when Satan goes to hell, he says, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? So people in hell are going to see Satan go into hell. And they're going to think, you're just like one of us now? You're meant to be this powerful you know, ruler on the earth and, and you're just now being tormented like us? Thy pomp, right? thy pride is brought down to the grave and the noise of thy vials. Right? So Satan's a musical creature. The worm is spread under thee and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? So this is why people believe the name of Satan is Lucifer. Because even though this is talking about the king of Babylon, we see here that there's a spiritual aspect in terms of it's talking about Satan. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How, how art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will send into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So this is where we get some insight into the pride that Satan had, that he thought he would be like God. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? All right, so that's to be about the king of Babylon, and we believe that that's talking about Satan one day being cast into hell. Revelation 20 is where we actually see this happen. Revelation 20, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So it's interesting that in the end times, we will rule and reign with Christ a thousand years. And in that thousand year period, Satan is going to be bound in heaven, being, uh, sorry, in hell, being tormented. But then after that thousand years, he's loosed for a little season to deceive the nations one last time before the great white throne judgment. So that's number three. Hell is God's righteous judgment, right? So we don't want to get this idea that we learn from cartoons and from Simpsons that Satan, you know, is, is ruling and reigning in hell. No, one day Satan is going to be thrown in hell and tormented just like everyone else there. And the people that see Satan go into hell are, are going to be shocked at that and say, you've just become like the rest of us who are thrown into hell. All right, number four is that hell is eternal. Hell is an eternal punishment. And this is probably the hardest thing to comprehend about hell, that a place as terrible as hell is not only that terrible, a place of fire and torment, but it actually goes on forever and ever and ever with no end in sight. Um, and people, this, this is a really uncomfortable doctrine for people because they just cannot imagine a place that exists like this. And they come up with false doctrines. They come up with false doctrine um, of uh, uh, annihilation. I don't know if you ever heard that doctrine. Uh, some people believe that when you go to hell, you don't actually go there to be tormented day and night forever and ever. You actually go there and then you're annihilated, meaning you just cease to exist. But I want to show you from the Bible why that isn't true and why annihilation is a false doctrine. 
Let's look, we're at Revelation 20, right? We're talking about Satan being loose. If we go a bit back into Revelation 19, just reading the last couple of verses, we see here the beast and the false prophet, right? So the beast is the Antichrist and the false prophet is the one, he's kind of like the, 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 um, the copycat of John the Baptist, right? Coming before Jesus, right? And he's, he's the prophet that's sort of pointing people to the beast, just like John the Baptist was pointing people to, to Jesus Christ. He says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Right? That's Jesus Christ. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These were both... These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So this is in uh, Revelation 19 where the beast and the false prophet, these are two men, right? Because, because people will say, well, the angels get thrown into hell too. But the whole annihilation doctrine says, well, it's because angels are eternal, right? So angels will keep on burning forever and ever. But men get totally annihilated. But here you have the beast and the false prophet, which are two men. They both were cast alive into a lake with, of fire burning with brimstone. So now the beast and the false prophet, where are they? They're in the lake of fire. Now we read just the beginning part of Revelation 20. When we get down to verse 7, when Satan comes out again after the thousand years, it says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, which is hell, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So, through this thousand year reign, it's interesting that in this thousand year reign, people are not happy with Jesus ruling and reigning, right? Because Jesus says he's going to rule with a rod of iron, right? And because he's God, he knows. But there are still people that he kind of lets get away with the rebellion. And this rebellion is kind of building up over this thousand years. So Satan comes out after a thousand years of being in hell and he gathers all these people together that don't want to worship Jesus Christ, right? And then he brings them all for this final battle um, at Gog and Magog. He says, uh, they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints round about, right? So they, they're get going around the city where God is, uh, where Jesus Christ is, and the beloved city, and look at this, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So just in, in one sentence, they're just all gone, right? <laughs> this fire comes down. So it didn't, the battle didn't last very long at all. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet, look at this, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, if an, the doctrine of annihilation was true, and men that get cast into the lake of fire are just annihilated, why is the beast and the false prophet still there 1,000 years later? Right? So in Revelation 19, they are both alive, cast into the lake of fire. Then Satan is bound for a thousand years. There's the thousand year reign. Then Satan comes out after the thousand year reign. Then there's the battle of Gog and Magog, right? Where the fire comes down from heaven and consumes them all. Satan is cast into the lake of fire. And the Bible says here, he's cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. Not were, not where they were. It's where they are because they're still there being tormented day and night forever and ever as men, right? Because they're not annihilated. Um... Here are some other passages that show you that hell is eternal. These shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Now, I, th I think the Jehovah's Witnesses Bible changes this to everlasting destruction or something. Whereas in the King James Bible, it says an everlasting punishment, right? It's because it's a punishment that lasts forever. It's not something that's just in an instant and then you're gone, right? Because it, hell is eternal. John 3.36, it says here, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So you see the difference between having eternal life is eternal death, and that's God's wrath abiding on you. Now, if you don't exist, how is it still abiding on you? Right? If you're just annihilated. Uh, Daniel 12, I'll just read verse 2 just for the sake of time. It says, And many of them that sleep, this is talking about the resurrection, in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and look at this, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So again, it's everlasting. It's not just something that happens and then you don't exist anymore, that you're annihilated. Um, let's look, look here in Luke 16. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And look at this. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. 
And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So we know that once you die, you go straight to hell, like we see in Luke 16. There's no purgatory. You know, the rich man, as soon as he died, he lift up his eyes and he was burning in hell. But what I want to tell you here is, um, the reason why I'm going to this passage, when it comes to the doctrine of annihilation and, and the eternal uh, punishment of hell, this is actually a weaker passage for our position in the sense of it's hard to prove an eternal hell from this passage because what they'll say is, yeah, he's in hell now burning in flames, but once he's cast into the lake of fire, that's when he's annihilated. Right? So I just wanted to bring that verse to your, your attention when you talk to somebody that doesn't believe in eternal hell. The stronger arguments are the ones that I've already showed you before. The last one, I think, which is a, a little bit of a weaker argument as well, um, even though I believe it supports our doctrine, I can see how people try to explain it away, is 2 Thessalonians 1. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's not teaching a work salvation because when you obey the gospel, it's when you believe on Jesus Christ. Right, that's obeying the gospel. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So they, see, I believe that is talking about that your, you know, your body is just, uh, and soul is destroyed in hell, but it's an everlasting punishment. But they'll take that as, that's where they get annihilation from. Like you're, just, you're, just, you're, you're destroyed everlasting, meaning like you're annihilated forever as opposed to actually tormented day and night forever and ever like the rest of the Bible says. So that's number four. Hell is an eternal punishment. Now, what I want to talk about in point five is that an eternal hell is a just punishment for sin. Now, a lot of people find it hard to accept an eternal punishment from God and they say things like, how can a loving God make a place as terrible as hell and not only as terrible as hell, but last forever and ever and ever? Now, what I need to get you to change your thinking on that is, see, when we think about hell being an unjust punishment for any sin, what you've really done in your mind is you've created just an arbitrary standard where you think, hey, this, these sins deserve this punishment and these sins deserve this punishment, and somehow you're just coming up with what you think is a just and right punishment. But the question is, if God is just and right, he's coming up with the right punishments, right? So if hell, an eternal hell... Is, is, is sufficient to punish sin, then that shows what God thinks of sin, right? So let's look at a passage. I just want to uh, show you this point in Genesis 18, right? So we don't want to take our own ideas and our own standard of judgment and apply it to the Bible because we're going to get big mis mixed up. We need to start from the Bible and see what God, how God punishes sin, realize that God is a righteous judge, and then realize, hey, that's what God thinks of sin. Right? So when we sort of just brush things off and we do things willy-nilly, right? We just sin and don't think it's a big deal. God does think it's a big deal. In fact, he thought it was such a big deal, he, he created a place called hell to punish it. I think this story in Genesis 18 illustrates that point really well because this is where Abraham really starts to question the righteousness and justice of God when God goes to, uh, to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham drew near and said, look at this, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Isn't that how people kind of think when they think about hell? They think, but there are righteous people that don't deserve to be tormented day and night forever and ever, right? They, that's how they accuse, they start to say things like that to God, right? And say, that, you know, the loving God wouldn't do this, right? Because they're thinking that this righteous God will destroy the righteous with the wicked. People that shouldn't be in hell are going to be there. So Abraham says, Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Right? He's saying to God, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Now it's interesting that Abraham asks this question because he's doubting the righteousness of God, right? He's doubting God's justice because the answer to this question is, of course the judge of all the earth will do right, right? Because God is perfect, he's holy and he's just. But here he's questioning the justice of God. And the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sake. So he actually answers his question and says he will do the right thing, right? Because if he actually finds righteous people, he's actually, he was actually willing to spare the whole city, for 50 righteous. And you know the rest of the story is like 40, 30, 20, 10 righteous. And, and God says, I will spare it for 10 righteous people. But then when he went there, there wasn't. 
right? There was only the two daughters and, and, and Lot and his wife, right? Um, so, <coughs> well, yeah, what was I getting at there? So, uh, how, how, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a just punishment, right? So, so we know that when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, what did he do? He removed the wicked, uh, the, the just from that city and then he destroyed it. So because we know the judge of all the earth will do right, we know that everyone that got destroyed in Sodom and Gomorrah, that's what they rightfully deserved. And it's going to be the same with hell, right? There's not going to be people that don't deserve to go to hell in hell, that shouldn't be in hell. Everyone that is in hell is going to be there for a reason, and that's the right thing that should be done because they didn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So it's not that it's an unjust punishment, it's very just. Deuteronomy 4, 5, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, Right? So he didn't only teach them laws, but he taught how to carry out judgment when those laws were broken. Even as the Lord my God commanded me that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation, look at this, is a wise and understanding people. Right? So God's statutes and judgments is what makes us wise and understanding. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? So you see the statutes and judgments of God are true and righteous. So when he deems hell and eternal hell is just for sin, we need to accept that by faith and understand because God is righteous and his statutes and judgments are righteous. Sometimes people will ask the question, because when it comes to the Old Testament laws, people will ask, you know, what do you think about capital punishment? Don't you think capital punishment is a bit harsh? And it's like, no, of course not, because I'm not, I'm not more righteous than God. You know, I, I'm not better than God. I don't know what's best, you know, more than God. If God says this is how you deal with certain crimes, then that's how you deal with certain crimes. That's the right way to deal with it. So. When it comes to even the topic of the death penalty, you know, we are not more righteous than God. We need to realize, hey, there's a reason why God has put the death penalty on certain sins. You know, homosexuality, uh, adultery, um, bestiality, you know, kidnapping, murder, um, you know, uh, smiting your parents. You know, people say like, well, should somebody get put to death for punching their parents in the face? And you say, yes. Because that's how serious God saw it, that he said if somebody even cursed their mother and father, wished ill upon their mother and father, the Bible says you, that person should be put to death. Because it's not that God is not righteous, because people say, how can, how can God do it? Well, it's because we don't realize how bad that sin is. And that's why we say, well, that's a harsh punishment. No, no, we're wrong, and God is right. Now, why is hell eternal? You know, obviously I have thoughts here, but I, I think it's the reason why it's eternal, because it's, it's sort of like, you know, to me, it's like people didn't want to put their trust on Jesus Christ. And when hell is eternal, they, they can't trust in anything anymore. Because if hell were not eternal, if one day you knew hell was going to stop, you would put your trust in that, like one day it's going to be over, right? But when hell just goes on forever and ever, it's God removes even the ability to trust in anything else, right? Um, you know, this, this, is, this is how bad hell is. This is why we don't want people to go there. All right, let's go on to number six. These last two will be a bit shorter, so don't, don't worry so much. But hell is not separation from God. Now, you hear this a lot in all different churches. You'll read it on a lot of gospel tracts where people say, you know, to go to hell, you know, the reason why hell is so bad is because you're just eternally separated from the love of God. And, and the burning of hell is just the burning desire to want to be in God's love. But you just can't get to it anymore because you're in hell. You're, you're separated from it. No, that, that's not what makes hell so bad. You know, hell is not bad because you're separated from God. What the Bible teaches, the reason why hell is so bad is because you're in the presence of God without your sins being forgiven. Have a look at this in Psalms 139. It says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? So whither means to where, right? So when you read whence or hence, it's to here, to, uh, uh, sorry, from here or from where. Uh, when it says whither, it's to where, right? So to where shall I go from thy spirit? To where shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. Look at this. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. So what does behold mean? Behold means to look, right? 
He's saying, when you get to hell, you're going to see him there too. When you go to heaven, he's there too. You can't get away from God. He's everywhere, right? Look what it says here in Revelation 14. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or his hand, so these are the people that receive the mark of the beast and worship Satan, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, right? This is hell, the lake of fire and brimstone. Look at this, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So does it sound like you're away from Jesus Christ when you're being tormented in hell? No, no. The reason why hell is so hot is because God is there, right? And you have not the righteousness of Christ on you. That's why you're burning in hell as a sinner. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Second, Second Thessalonians 1, look at this. So we, we read this passage before, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at this. And sh who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Look at this. From the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So it's not that you're punished away from the presence of the Lord and away from the glory of his power. You are punished from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. It's his presence and his glory that is punishing you. That's why hell is so hot. right? It's like the sun. That's why the sun is a picture of Jesus Christ because the sun is a really bright light that you can't look to and it's hot, it's fire as well, just like the presence of the Lord and his glory of his power. I thought this passage in Psalms 68 was really interesting. It says, Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let them also that hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. Look at this. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. Isn't that interesting? So it's saying like hell, like the wax in the presence of fire is being melted. That's like the people in hell, in the presence of God. That's why hell is so hot. So yeah, this idea that hell is separation from God, they just want that because they don't want God to be a God of hate as well. You know, people just think God is all lovey-dovey, fuzzy roses and things like that. And he just, all he is, he's just, he's just love, love, love. No, no, he, he is love. That's why he hates, right? He loves righteousness. That's why he hates sin. That's why heaven is such a, a beautiful, holy place. It's going to be perfect. You know, there's going to be pleasures that we don't even know about. But hell is just torment beyond our imagination, right? Because he's a God of extremes, right? So, like I said, hell is not, it's not separation from God. You know, hell is really in the presence of God. Now, this last one is just a, an issue of terminology. Because some people have this question where they say, well, if, if hell is in the heart of the earth, and we tell people that they're going to spend all eternity in hell, why in Revelation 20 we read about people being cast into the lake of fire? So it's an issue of terminology. People say, well, do you spend eternity in hell, or do you spend eternity in the lake of fire? It's a bit like with heaven, right? We say, well, when you die, do you, go, you, you spend eternity in heaven? Technically not, right? Like technically, when you die, but, we, but it's not wrong to say if you die today, would you go to heaven? Because if you were to die right now, you would go to heaven, right? But technically, where are we going to spend all eternity? We're going to spend all eternity on the new earth, right? Because God is going to, he's going to join us with our bodies. He's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. After we've ruled and reigned with Christ a thousand years, a new heaven and a new earth, and that's where we're going to be living for all eternity. So people think of that concept as heaven. But I understand, yeah, technically it's not heaven, right? Because he's creating a new heaven and a new earth, and we're living on the new earth. But if you were to die right now, you would go to heaven. So it's not a wrong question to ask people, right? We don't believe in soul sleep. Soul sleep, people believe that when you die, your soul is just like dormant and unconscious, and then you'll be resurrected. That's what the Jehovah's Witnesses believe, because they don't believe anyone goes to heaven, because only 144,000 are in heaven. So they say when you die right now, you just, your soul just sleeps, and then when you're resurrected, you'll be you know, on the earth, because you know, the meek shall inherit the earth. That's how they kind of see it. So they're kind of half right in the sense that we, we don't spend eternity in heaven, we spend eternity on the new earth. Um, and some people disagree over whether it's right to say you're going to spend eternity in hell because they say, well, you will go to hell right now, but one day you're going to be cast into the lake of fire. So they say, well, the terminology is actually right that you will spend eternity in the lake of fire. Right? So that's Revelation 20. Now, I don't agree with that, but I'll show you why. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. So 
So we see this is the great white throne judgment where basically everyone's being brought before Jesus Christ, which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now the way I understand it is hell right now is in the center of the earth. But at the great white throne judgment, what actually happens, and this is how I believe it, is that hell is actually relocated, right? So that's why it says death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. So they're relocated to the lake of fire and then everyone goes to the lake of fire and that's where hell is now, right? Whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, the reason why I believe it's right to say people will spend an eternity in hell is because I believe in the Bible, the lake of fire is still called hell. And I think the reason why it's still called hell is because hell is relocated there. We read here in Matthew 10, 28, Jesus says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Right? So man can't, they can only kill you, but they can't take away your salvation. Right? They can't send you to hell, but only God can. But rather excuse me, fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now the reason why I believe that is a passage referring to the lake of fire is because when you, if, if an unbeliever was to die right now, their body doesn't go to hell, right? Because their body, you know, if you have an unbelieving loved one that dies and, and goes to hell, I mean you bury their body at the funeral and things like that. Like, or the, you know, the body gets buried and put in the grave. Right? But their soul goes to hell, like the rich man in Luke 16. So the soul is burning and being tormented in hell. But at the second coming of Jesus Christ, when everyone is reunited, right? Oh, oh sorry, we are, but at the, at the great white throne judgment, when they're delivered up out of hell, they are reunited with their body, right? That's the resurrection of damnation. So they're reunited with their body and then they're cast into the lake of fire. So, but this passage here is saying, that, oh sorry, I won't do this one, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So if hell was only the place in the center of the earth, then where are they getting thrown to where it's the soul and the body being destroyed? Well, that's the lake of fire. But we see here in Matthew 10, 28, it's still being referred to as hell. Do you see that? So even though people say, well, technically you're not gonna spend eternity in the center of the earth, you're gonna spend eternity as an unbeliever in the lake of fire, that lake of fire is still referred to by Jesus Christ as hell because that's where both soul and body will go for the unbeliever. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, look at this, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. So I know it's a bit of a technicality, but I personally believe it's not wrong to say that you'll spend eternity in hell as an unbeliever, because the even though the lake of fire is distinct from hell, you know, these two are one, <laughs> right? In that sense, right? Because one day hell's gonna be relocated to the lake of fire and that, it's still called hell. All right, so just a few closing thoughts. You know, hopefully, hopefully this sermon's been interesting for you. If you've heard me teach on this before, it's probably nothing new to you, but a good reminder. You know, when we think about hell and how terrible it is, I mean, thank God that we're not going there. You know, thank God that the, because of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you just put your faith on Jesus Christ, you never have to worry about ever feeling the flames of hell. You know, this earth is as close to hell as you are ever going to get. And when you die, you're going to be in glory with the Lord Jesus Christ. So thank God for that. But, you know, we need to make sure we're saved. You know, obviously, I don't know everyone's heart here. You know, you need to make sure you, need to make sure you do believe on Jesus Christ. Because if you don't believe on Jesus Christ, that is where you'll spend all eternity. And this is what ought to motivate us. Like I said, when we preached about soul winning, this is what one thing that should motivate us to preach the gospel because if people don't get saved, this is where they're going. So we don't want to treat soul winning like a game. You know, this is not just something we dabble in. This is something that we need to be serious about, guys, because souls are at stake. We need to get involved in soul winning. And I hope that this sermon motivates you a bit to get involved into the soul winning. All right, so I hope that was a blessing to you. Uh, I know it's not a pleasant topic, but on the same token, thank God, that that's what Jesus Christ saved us from. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, for your word. I, I thank you that, you know, on some topics, you just give us so much information. We can just get so much insight into the things of the, of the spirit that we, we don't know about, that we don't see with our own eyes. 
I thank you, Lord, that you've given us this warning. And I pray, Lord, that we would take it upon ourselves to be the ambassador you've called us to be and to preach the gospel. And um, we just thank you so much, Lord, that you went through all this to save us from this terrible place, this place of eternal uh, punishment. And Lord, help us never to doubt your justice. We pray that uh, we would have a right understanding of hell so that we can have sound doctrine. And uh, Lord, teach us from your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.